Welcome to another Dolphin Communication Project Dolphin Lesson. Today we are going to learn how to draw a beluga. And we are joined once again from uh, by our drawing expert, because um, that is not me. Uh, Reina is here, um, and she is on a bit of a beluga kick at the moment, so she thought she would share this with us today. Um, she has recently done a bit of beluga research. Um, she lives in Quebec, and there is an endangered population of belugas there, um, so we hope that this is a fun drawing lesson. Uh, we hope you all learn a bit, and then maybe it will inspire you to go and learn a bit more about belugas and where they are endangered around the world. Um, as a reminder, this program, if you're joining live, is being recorded, so go ahead and keep your videos off if you don't want to be visible, and you will find your microphones are muted, so please use the chat function to submit your questions. And if you're watching us on a recording, thank you very much for joining us, and we will let you know how you can find even more programs. Um, and with that, I am going to pass it over to Reina. Thank you so much, Kel. Make sure my microphone is unmuted. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay. Let's get started. Yeah, like Kel said, um, I'm definitely on a beluga kick. Um, I love them. I uh, yeah did a, um, an internship this summer, um, and I was able to learn a little bit more about um, the endangered belugas in the St. Lawrence River, and that's in the province where I grew up. So yeah, they're definitely really close to my heart, and they're just so cute and charismatic, and um, I was really, really happy to be able to see them. And I'm happy that you guys are here with me to draw one today. So this is um, our beluga whale. Um, so if you haven't already, grab a paper or sketchbook and a pencil or pen, and let's get started. Okay, so usually what I like to start with is um, the melon of the whale. So, um, if you don't know what the melon is, the melon is a pretty funny word for the forehead. Um, so here, we're, I, I usually like to start with it. So let's go and draw the melon here. Um, and I'm gonna start from the left side of my paper. So just make sure that you have enough room to kind of um, extend uh, into the right side. So, here we go. And compared to um, other cetaceans, other dolphins and whales, belugas have really bulbous, really big melon. And what's really cool about them is they're actually like really flexible and they can move. And so if you press onto, I wouldn't recommend that you, you press onto, um, <laughs> that you touch a beluga with your, with your hands. But if you did, you would see that it's like kind of squishy compared to like maybe a bottlenose dolphin that, or a spotted dolphin that DCP studies, um, when you press onto like their melon, it kind of feels more like <laughs> more like your forehead where it's, it's kind of firm because there's, um, but, with the belugas, they're very, they're very squishy and flexible. And if you look at, if you watch beluga um, kind of like swimming around and behaving, you'll see that they can actually change the shape of their melon, which is really, really cool. Um, and I think that helps them really focus uh, their echolocation. Um, and, and that ability to uh, change the shape of their melon does also help change the sounds that they're making with their blowholes. And that uh, is an important factor when they're communicating with other belugas. That's super cool. And I think, okay, so I, I also saw a DCP webinar that talked about how like changing the shape of the melon can also be like um, a signal to other belugas, like more of a visual signal um, that is maybe um, like, uh, maybe they changed their melon shape in different like social contexts and stuff. So um, that was a really cool webinar <laughs> that um, is the recordings on the DCP YouTube channel if anybody wants to take a look at that, but I really enjoyed that. Um, so let's keep going. Let's uh, start drawing kind of like the back of the beluga or like the dorsal side. And usually here, so let me start doing that. And I'm going to add a line kind of going up because we're, we're going to have the body kind of go up here. 
And usually when I get to this point, if I'm drawing a dolphin or an orca, um, this is where I draw like a really big dorsal fin. But belugas don't actually have a dorsal fin. They have more what's called a dorsal bridge. And so instead of having like a big triangle coming out, we're just gonna draw like kind of like a little bump like this. And that dorsal ridge having the lack of a dorsal fin, all right, it's kind of weird if my, just my little voice is popping in, um, helps them because they live in really cold waters where there can be lots of ice coverage. Um, so that is better for them to just have that ridge instead of a, a dorsal fin. Yeah, and I know that for a lot of dolphins and whales, like looking at their dorsal fin and the markings on the dorsal fin, that's a really good way to be able to identify individuals. And so when I was working with beluga scientists, I asked, well, okay, if they don't have a dorsal fin, like how, how do you keep track of individuals? Because that's something that they're interested in. And they said, well, we do take pictures of the dorsal ridge and there are markings on them. And that's, we, we do use the dorsal ridge to, uh, to identify individuals, but it's pretty hard because a lot of the times a marking on a dorsal fin might be like a white scar, but the beluga is already white and you don't have a lot of surface area to work with, with the little ridge. Um, so <laughs> they, they have a bit of a hard job, but they are definitely still able to get um, individual identifications with just uh, the dorsal ridge pictures. Let's keep going. Let's finish up um, the back area here. Um, so we're just gonna add this line going up here and we'll, we'll, we'll get to this section later. But for now, I'm going to go back to the front here um, and draw the beluga's rostrum. And so compared to maybe some dolphins, the beluga has kind of like a short, short, but kind of, I want to say like kind of fat rostrum that kind of goes down like this. And then we're, this is just like the, the bottom of the jaw here. And a beluga researcher, a friend of DCP was telling us that um, like a walrus will do, belugas will actually squirt water and they do that at the sand to find, to disrupt little crustaceans hiding that they then will eat. That's so cool. Okay, um, I'm actually going to add just a little bit more to, so like I mentioned before, the beluga melon is like, is, is very like big and bulbous. And so when you look at a picture of a beluga, some, like you can really tell um, the spot between where the melon ends and the rostrum begins. So I just added like a little stroke here just to really show, like really highlight that, um, that big beluga melon. Okay, and so now let's, so, so now we've kind of drawn the upper and lower jaw or the upper and lower rostrum um, together. So let's draw the line that kind of separates that. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw it so that it kind of looks like it's, it's turned a little bit. So you see the front of the rostrum a little bit, um, which is like uh, this, this bump here. So we'll just keep that in mind. So we'll go up and then kind of extend the line up like this. Okay, so starting to look a little bit more like a beluga now, we're going to continue and start drawing the ventral side or the belly. And, uh, and <laughs> I, I think part of the reason why belugas are so cute is because they have so much blubber, which they need because they live in really, really cold Arctic waters. Um, but they're not as streamlined and sleek as maybe some other, um, as, as maybe some dolphins are. So so when I draw a dolphin, like I'd, I'd maybe come, uh, like continue this uh, line from the lower rostrum. But what we're going to do here is we're actually, we're really going to bring it down um, to show their like kind of big blubbery belly. So let's do that. I'm going to make sure you can see. And then we'll really bring it down at an angle like this. And I'm going to make a, uh, I'm going to pause here because I'm going to be drying the fins. Okay, now from here, I'm gonna draw um, the first pectoral fin. And so I'm going to start by just making a line coming down like this. And then I'm gonna draw the other side. And what I find with belugas, their 
pectoral fins. They're very broad. They kind of look like paddles. They almost look a little squarish. So I'm going to come and add another line here and then kind of complete the rest of the fin like this. A little bit more. And there we have that broad pectoral fin that they use to navigate or to position themselves in the water. I'll let Cal jump in. Yeah, and they can actually swim backwards by using their pectoral fins. And that really helps them be able to turn and move out of tight areas if they've been exploring, looking for food, ventured in and out of shallow waters, or they're dealing with some ice. So they have a lot of ability to, to move around because of those pectoral fins. Wow, that's super cool. Cause yeah, like they look kind of chonky, <laughs> but in fact, like they must have to, they have to be very maneuverable because they, they spend time maybe like Kelsen in shallow waters, or maybe there's like, there's ice on all sides. So they, um, they need to be able to do, make some very tight turns. Okay. So now we have, um, our first peck fin and then let's just draw the the other one that we kind of see from the other side here pretty much the same thing i'm going to do it a little bit smaller since it's a little bit further from us and bring it up like this and let's go ahead and we'll draw the rest of the belly here um and so i want you to kind of imagine that this line actually you see you see the curve of the line that you've you've drawn here already kind of just like imagine that it continues um, from behind the pectoral fin, and then we'll go ahead and continue the line all the way up here, and we'll go and meet the line that we drew um, of the beluga's back up here. All right. I noticed that there was a question in the chat. Can any other dolphin swim backwards? I don't know the answer. <laughs> so we'll see if we can uh, get folks that answer by the end of the program. We're going to look into it. Oh, let's see if Nicole knows. Um, so the question should really be, can any other toothed whales or small whales swim backwards? Mm -hmm. And the answer is river dolphins can. And oh. the funny thing that beluga whales and river dolphins have in common is what you were saying about living in shallow water and they have to get themselves out of any little nooks that they might have gotten themselves into looking for food and stuff. And they also have pretty big paddle-like pectoral oh, fins. That's really interesting. Yeah, so it must be like the shape and that like paddle-like, that paddle-like shape that helps them be able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think like with river dolphins too, like sometimes they'll like during when it's like really flooded they'll go be they'll even be go between like roots of trees and that kind of thing so yeah they gotta be they gotta be pretty nimble I think yeah and the dolphins that we study and probably you know sperm whales and other toothed whales live in the open ocean they have no reason to have to they can their pet fins like that mm -hmm. exactly. that makes sense thank you yeah and it yeah thanks Nicole and I think also I think um one one of the things that I want to mention that when we were when we were up here drawing kind of like the beluga neck was that um, I think the way that um, the beluga like um, spine or like neck bones are they're like not fused so compared to other toothed whales they have a lot of um, motion or mobility in their neck so they can really like turn and look from side to side and like up and down a little bit whereas. I think, yeah, a lot of other toothed whales, they're kind of, if they need to turn and like look behind them, they really need to turn their whole body to do that. So they're, uh, these guys are, they're very flexible. All right, um, we're almost done. Let's draw the next obvious thing that's missing, which is the flukes. And so let's just start by, look at, you see these two lines that we have here. So. Um, we'll start by just drawing two curves that come out of the lines that we drew for uh, the back and the belly. And then with belugas, um, I find that 
uh, their their flukes they're they're quite they're quite flat like at the edge so what we're just going to do is we're going to start from the middle and then we're going to draw a little curve coming out but it'll be pretty flat um you can draw you can uh, i added like a little bit of a little bit of squiggliness but but not too much compared to maybe some other um other whales that i've i've drawn um and then we'll just do the same thing on the other side do the researchers studying belugas also use the flukes for photo ID? I think so. I think that definitely helps. Um, but the when I, I think the most reliable pictures to get are the dorsal ridge because I, I think when, when they surface, they'll surface pretty regularly and you'll almost always see the dorsal ridge, whereas the flukes, it's great if they can get it, but um, they, when, when they're just traveling or um, yeah, kind of milling about, um, you might not always see the flukes. Um, so I think it's primarily the dorsal ridge, but um, for certain individuals, if they have like both a dorsal ridge picture and a flute picture and they know it's the same one, that can be really helpful uh, for photo ID. And I'm just going to, from here, um, extend this uh, dorsal line just up a little bit um, into, into the flukes here. All right, I think we're still missing two really important body parts. Um, I think you guys probably know which one's coming next. Um, our beluga needs an eye. So I'm just gonna draw a little cute little eye just kind of off to the side of the rostrum here. Their eyes are pretty small, so I'm just gonna keep it kind of like a cute little dot like this. And then our last finishing touch, of course, um, we, our whale needs to breathe and our whale breathes air. So we're gonna draw a little blow hole low hole up here. And um, this fits in well with a question that we got, um, and it is related to when they're born, that yes, they already know how to swim. And that's particularly important because they need to breathe air. Um, so just like us, they, they need to get to the surface, they need to be able to breathe air. And so knowing how to swim as soon as you're born is a really important um, characteristic in order yes. to survive in the mm -hmm. ocean. Um, and then they also, in addition for breathing, they use their blowholes um, like other, like the dolphins we study to make different sounds. And they have a bit of a nickname of the canaries of the sea, which has nothing to do really with the coal mine uh, yeah. saying yeah. about canaries, but because like birds, they make a lot of different sounds. And some of their sounds, some of the beluga whale sounds even sound like birds. Um, so lots of people spend their whole career studying the vocalizations yes. of these animals. Yeah, the beluga bioacoustics are a really, really big field of study. I actually, I think I have a web page loaded with some with some beluga whistles. So I'm going to see if I can play it and share it with you. There we go. <laughs> so that's just a, a little taste of beluga vocalization that they make with their blowhole. Um, and I think it, it sounds really, really cool. And there's a lot that um, we can learn from, from listening to them. But yeah, here we have it. Here is our beluga. Um, I hope yours looks great. I'm sure it does. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, and then we'll wrap up. And first we will um, address the, the elephant in the room um, that when one makes a coloring page for a beluga whale, that's a little tricky uh, because they are mostly white. Um, but Raina, what color are baby belugas when they're born? They're actually a dark, dark gray. Gray, a little bit brownish. I've heard beluga scientists call them a little, they, they say they look kind of like sausages, which I think is true. <laughs> so if you decide to do your sketch and then color it, um, or if you download the worksheet on DCP's webpage, um, you can color yours a baby beluga if you want, or you can 
just be creative in uh, your imagination and decorate your beluga however you'd like. Yeah, definitely. And I think they're born really dark and then they don't they don't switch from really dark to really white, right? The adult belugas maybe like that are at least like six or maybe eight years old. They're like completely white, but you can tell which beluga is like kind of a kind of a juvenile and get like a rough idea of um, how old they are by, by looking at their colors. So they, they start lightening up, but they're still they're still like a lighter gray for, for several years before turning into that pure white color. Awesome. Um, and that segues nicely to a question about play. Um, and yes, beluga whales do play. Um, they play a lot. Um, and some of them, um, some colleagues of ours were telling us that they do a mouth game where the belugas put their mouths together. Um, and it's like holding hands, but with their mouths instead. Um, so that's one of the kind of interesting behaviors, I think, that you see among beluga whales that you don't necessarily see among other whales. That's super, super cool. Yeah, there's so, there's so much that we don't know yet about belugas too, and I feel like um, we're, we're learning more all the time. So it's a very exciting research space. Well, thank you, Reina. And um, a last little tidbit will maybe segue to our invitation uh, for a future drawing lesson is that the closest living relative of the beluga is a narwhal. Um, so that's another cold northern uh, whale. And sometimes belugas and narwhals are actually seen swimming together. Um, so you could potentially, you know, see them both at, at some point. Um, I, I've never seen a narwhal at all, so I just want to see one somewhere someday. Um, so maybe that, that will be our little, hmm, maybe we can have a narwhal drawing lesson one day. That would be pretty fun. Excellent. Um, well, I'm just going to um, steal your screen share um, and just give folks a little bit of concluding information. Um, and so if you have anything else to add, Raina or Nicole, please feel free. Um, if you are looking for other DCP webinar recordings, you can head straight to our website and under the education tab, you'll find webinars. And that's where the upcoming schedule is posted as well as all of, all of our recordings. You can also find the recordings on our YouTube channel, Dolphin Communication Project. Um, Deep dives are a little bit more advanced than a dolphin lesson, a little bit longer of a presentation. Those are geared toward ages 14 and up, but everyone is welcome. Our next one is later this month, um, and it is going to talk about dolphin feeding techniques, including uh, mud ring feeding. Um, and so if you're listening to this live, you can tune in. I think it's the 21st. And if you're catching this on a recording, you can go look for that recording as well. And then this was a dolphin lesson. So open to everybody, but geared towards younger audiences and a little bit shorter. And then if you've cruised through all of our webinars and you're still looking for more, make sure you check out our podcast, The Dolphin Pod. And to access that latest uh, Beluga worksheet, head to our website. Also under that education tab, you'll find kids science activities. And then there are all sorts of PDFs to download. Um, so activities, worksheets, um, games, all sorts of things there and the Beluga page has just been added as well. And then of course, thank you. Um, so we appreciate everyone who comes to our webinars um, and explores our activities. You can stay in touch. You have all of our info there on the screen. And of course, we're a US nonprofit, so we rely on our supporters in order to keep things going. So if you're interested in supporting DCP, you can adopt a wild dolphin, become a member. Uh, you can even join us in the field. Um, we're currently recruiting for our Bimini uh, July 2022, I can't believe it's all that <laughs> we're even saying that year. Um, and then you can select us as your Amazon Smile charity, pick up a Wanderer bracelet, all sorts of ways to support us. Um, so with that, a huge thank you to everyone who joined and most especially to Reina. Thank you so much for leading another drawing lesson. Um, we really appreciate it and always love it. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining guys.